you know, while I was sleeping, we were making money. And that's how it started. But I wanted to talk about why this is going to be India's century. Foreign reserves, there were four billion at one stage. And uh, we had to uh, India had to sell their gold at one stage. Uh, and uh, now 600 billion, and it should get up to a trillion or two, uh, because India is producing so much. Last year, India exported 21 billion pounds worth to the UK. The UK exported 15 billion pounds to India. Now, the point about a trade deal is that the duties come down to zero, right? And when that happens, trade doubles within three years. So can you imagine a trade deal could do 1 billion new jobs for India? Yeah. And why is it not happening? Ego, civil servants on both sides. Uh, and, and they don't have any skin in the game. And this episode is in collaboration with Bridge India, a UK award-winning progressive non-profit think tank dedicated to discourse on public policy. With Bridge India, The Mover Show will provide a larger platform for UK stories to reach the Indian diaspora and vice versa. So hi, in today's episode, we have with us Dinesh Dhamija, is a British Indian entrepreneur, author, politician and philanthropist who's made his name as the founder of an online travel agency called ebookers.com and is pushing for a UK-India trade deal. Yes, you heard me right, for a UK-India trade deal. A first-generation immigrant from India who moved to the UK in the 1960s and has since lived and worked in many, many countries. Um, he's also the founder and chairman of Cooper Beach that Dinesh will talk to us about. Dinesh also manages investments in sustainable projects in Europe, including creating a utility-sized solar energy company in Romania. So this is a long bio data of many more achievements for Dinesh, and it's such an honor for me to have you here with me. He is also a member of the European Parliament, representing London, the vice chair of the Global Board of Thai, a global entrepreneurs organization, fellow of Fitzwilliam College, Cambridge. Um, so, Dinesh, this was a very long introduction and we don't often get uh, such great, uh, you know, uh, things to talk about. And uh, we are so excited to have you here today with us because everybody in India only wants to go abroad and live a life there. And I think all of them are going to be very, very excited to know how is it that they can get in touch with you and figure out, post this podcast, as to how to really figure their way offshore. But... Yeah. Before that, uh, we need to talk a little bit about the fact that you were born in Australia to an Indian diplomat parent, grew up in various countries, and you also spoke to me about being in Delhi. And this is really a global influence of having lived across the countries, right? So what is it that has really been the most uh, you know, determining factor in your personality over the years? Well, thank you very much for the introduction. I'm sorry it was long. Uh, by the way, the um, member of the European Parliament and uh, Vice Chair of Thai Global Board were in the past because obviously the UK has brexited. Uh, and um, uh, no, I mean, I, I think that uh, uh, Indians do want to come abroad. Obviously, the weather is pretty hot at the moment. So, so everyone wants to, and I, I don't blame them. I, I, th I also feel that um, our, uh, uh, the Indian uh, resorts in the Himalayas and places should also be visited because uh, uh, they are really great. I've been to quite a few. Uh, now, to answer your question as to how, how I feel being um, uh, living here and talking about India, is that what you asked? I'm yes, not... a lot of that. And also the fact that you've been in so many countries, how has it impacted your oh. outlook? Yeah. You know, I was a ebookers.com is a travel agency. And so I was born in Australia and my parents moved from country to country every three years. And thus I was, a, I became a travel agent from, from the time I was born, really. Uh, I got to know lots of nice places. It's really nice sometimes to see the viewpoints of other countries where you live and work because uh, that gives you a lot of lateral thinking when it comes to doing your own job, um, you know, or your own work. So I think it's great to meet new people. It keeps you, um, you know, down to earth because you're learning much more all the time. 
Yes. Uh, so, you know what, it's extremely interesting. While I was just reading up, uh, you were actually, you started, uh, you know, ebookers.com out of a tube station in London, uh, selling tickets out of a kiosk, you know, in 1980 with your wife. And uh, we'd really like to go back into this time, you know, in 1980, when I think uh, internet was not really in a huge way. And uh, how was that entire experience from there to here? Well, the the internet actually came in the mid '90s um, when Amazon and Yahoo and in, uh, all, all these other companies, uh, AOL, became pretty prominent. But I started in a, in a bricks and mortar way in in Earl's Court Tube Station, and the reason why um, I wanted to have my own business, and and you know, one in five businesses succeed. Um, uh, so it was obviously a big punt. Uh, was that the taxation system uh, in, in, in the UK, as I think it's the same in India, uh, was that nearly 50% of your salary at that time was being taken away in taxes, uh, income tax and national insurance tax. And uh, I thought if I could earn the same amount of money and expensed most of my earnings, I would double my salary living. So it was a quest for doubling my standard of living. And I said, well, you know, if you work for someone, half your money goes away. If you work for yourself, you keep the whole amount. That is doubling. So uh, that's what started us going. And there was me and my wife, Tani, who uh, we were sitting there in this kiosk, about 80 square feet. And we were uh, hoping that people would walk in. And, uh, and no one did. So we had to put sandwich boards. I don't know if you know what they are. But yes. boards that, yeah. that say, arrow this way, <laughs> you know, <laughs> come into the door kind of thing. And that's how we started. By God, that's quite a journey, right? No. So there was, a, there was a friend of mine. Uh, I mean, she was the wife of a friend of mine, the, both friends. Uh, she said, I'm doing nothing. Can I come and sit with you? So <laughs> there were three of us. Oh, how and, lovely is that? That's and we fantastic. were talking about well, how are we going to you know, pay the mortgage kind of thing. Uh, but it didn't actually. Uh, we started selling theater tickets and God knows what else. And one thing led to another. I went into the internet, in, into e-bookers, um, in, in 90, end of 96, when everyone in Europe had thought uh, that internet was nothing. Uh, the States had taken off. Uh, and I went to the States, and they were all buzzing. I mean, one of the professors uh, at Harvard Business School, which a small course I took, uh, said, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the GDP of Zambia, Kuwait, and New Zealand is equal to the market capitalization of AOL, Yahoo, and Amazon. And we wow. uh, just said, what? A country and, you know, with so many people. And so we said, God, we've got to get into this internet game. And that's what happened. Um, but when I came to the UK, they were a bit behind and Europe, a bit behind the US, and they were just saying, you know, it's rubbish and the, this is an American fad. And, uh, and in a couple of years, uh, these are friends of mine who ran other travel agencies, uh, uh, were kissing my ring. So <laughs> there we are. How amazing, my God. Were there moments of, uh, you know, uh, did you ever question this entire thing when you were like marching ahead different from the others? Were there moments when you felt insecure? Sure. There was a, a time when uh, the chap who in Germany who wrote this program uh, had connected the, the bookings, if they came, to my mobile phone. And there would be an alarm at 8 in the morning and at 12 midnight on my phone to see how many bookings we got. And uh, I said, till I don't see a lot of bookings, I'm not paying you. Yeah. So, so 
he, so every day, the buzzer used to go at eight in the morning and 12 at night. And the bookings were zero, 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 zero. <laughs> I said, thank God I didn't pay this guy, you know. And then one day at eight in the morning, there were two bookings. And I said, this must be this chap from Germany making two bookings and showing that there are bookings. Yeah. Anyway, I rang up the office because I wasn't there at eight in the morning. And they said, we've got two bookings and they're going to Paris and blah, blah, blah. And we've got their credit cards and they worked. We said, wow. You know, while I was sleeping, we were making money. And that's how it started. Wonderful. I mean, this line is to be repeated that while he was sleeping, they were, he was making money. My God. Okay. <laughs> so you've sold e-bookers, right? And you transitioned into politics, into charity work and a new business in green energy now. So can you tell us a little bit about this transition, you know, from your uh, and your current endeavors and how did this entire transition happen? When did you think that you needed to transition or you wanted to just kind of sell and because I think as an entrepreneur, that's a very really difficult. That, I'm not that intelligent. Um, uh, when I sold eBookers, they asked me to, to have a 10-year non-compete. And I agreed, which means I couldn't get into the travel business, which is the only thing I knew because I'd been doing that for 25 years. So um, I thought, okay, well, why don't I just put most of my money into property? and uh, stuff like that. So anyway, uh, as the 10 years was ending, everyone said, are you going into the travel business? And I said, not really. You know, I don't know what's going on. And, and um, why don't I do something in politics and help people? You know, because I had the money um, after selling e-bookers. And that's why I went into politics. Uh, of course, I found out that once uh, I went into politics, it's not the same thing as helping people. You've got to help yourself first, <laughs> and try and get somewhere. And then if you can get somewhere, uh, you could try and help people. One of the things I did in the European Union, oh, I didn't do, but I was part of the group that did, was to change the chargers for all mobile phones to one, fo one kind of plug. Uh, Wonderful. Which we thought that there were, uh, I think, the amount of uh, these charger li um, cables and other things that used to go into the bin were about 50 tons or 500 tons, something like that. Yeah. And of course, we had to also pay 25, 30 euros or pounds for these chargers. So, so Apple had one and, and, and Samsung, and, and they had one. I mean, it just didn't. So anyway, after a, they lobbied like hell, but uh, we got, got it through. Amazing, Dinesh. I mean, I'm just uh, like, <laughs> I'm just so enamored listening to it all. And I'm sure all our listeners are taking in so many notes while they're listening to you. You also have Chikitsa and Shiksha, your philanthropic effort, you know, in India. Why did you decide to get into this? And tell us a little bit about this. Well, uh, Chikitsa gives 120,000 people free medicine, for, you know, um, through 15 clinics. Uh, it's in the um, NCR area, but it's it's Gurgaon, that sort of area. And uh, Shiksha gives 1,200 uh, street kids free schooling. And we've been doing both these things for about 17 years or 18 years now. Time flies. Uh, my brother-in-law, uh, who was uh, ambassador, Indian ambassador in Moscow, but also, so he was at secretary level, uh, he and his son, Uday, look after uh, these charities. Um, and uh, I was, I gave the money. So whenever I go, um, you know, and we, we we're always trying to do better. But the other thing, you know, if, if you, we could do 240,000 uh, uh, people in Chikitsa or, or half a million, not a big deal. But uh, I, th I think you've got to just have premises, have a place, and have management to be able to do this. But when the um, uh, COVID thing happened, uh, COVID-19, um, I sent 480,000 masks to India, one container load. Uh, 
to uh, to 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 Mumbai and then on to Hyderabad uh, because they would take us there. Oh yes, we couldn't take, we couldn't take it in Delhi. Oh yes, there was. There were so many people without masks and, you know, one felt guilty if one was throwing away masks. It was a very crazy time in India, for sure. Absolutely. Uh, so let's talk a little about your latest book, The Indian Century, which has been really, really making waves. So can you tell us what inspired you? Yes. Thank you. What inspired you to write this book? Well, I think um, I saw India going places. I, I'm not backing one prime minister or one government up to another. I'm just saying that the things that were being done, I'm talking about financial inclusivity. And I'm talking about, you know, there are three or 400 million people that don't have running water or electricity in India. This is a travesty. We need to get all these people so that uh, electricity and running water, but electricity so that their day becomes, uh, they can work at night. They can study at night. They can do their homework at night. You know, otherwise, lampposts, that doesn't work. Um, so pe people's lives are doubled. You know? So uh, this is so important. And this, how do you do this? You can't just give money to, to them. What you've got to do is have a trickle-down effect. And that's what's happening. Uh, if you see the uh, economy, um, the GDP, has done, I mean, it's gone up from 2015 or so, it's gone up um, one and a half to two trillion dollars a year. Well, dollars here is not as big as dollars in India. So yes. it is fantastic. So um, I thought I'd write this book, uh, talk about the tech stack, talk about uh, the various things that are happening. Of course, there are also not so good things happening. But I didn't want to talk about that. I wanted to talk about why this is going to be India's century. And I looked at China, and initially it was the Chinese living abroad, the Chinese diaspora, who invested in China. Before the Americans and the Europeans followed, and look what China has done. You know, and, and we want the same. I want India to be the same. We're putting money in. I mean, there's uh, the foreign reserves are now around 600 billion. Uh, I remember uh, there were 4 billion at one stage. And uh, we had to sell, uh, India had to sell their gold at one stage. Uh, and uh, now 600 billion, and it should get up to a trillion or two, uh, because India is producing so much. You've also spoken about the global balance of power, you know, so it'll be fantastic, actually, for I think our listeners to understand what do you mean with the context, you know, with the world and uh, what do you mean by India's surge, uh, you know, influences this entire global balance of power? What what is the meaning of this to you? I, I, I think it's important that we've been order takers, or India has been order takers, uh, because uh, India wasn't, wasn't strong enough. It's as simple as that. Uh, either they were very humble and there was humility, uh, but it was that colonial thing yes. of, of, uh, of listening to armchair colonialists sitting in the West. And... Uh, I think the Russians treated India much better, and that's why the relationship uh, is quite good with Russia versus what the uh, what the West did. And they also backed uh, Pakistan a lot. Uh, and of course, um, they backed China too, because all the money till about 10 or 20 years ago was going into China. Without realizing that they're they're they're, they're making a, a huge track who is going to eat them up. So uh, um, I think their their foreign policy was pretty. But uh, Mr. Jay Shankar is the man. He um, I I love listening to him. My father was an ambassador in many countries. My brother-in-law is and my father-in-law was the chief of the Indian Army. Uh, uh, a week. 
I love listening to him and saying, for example, uh, India buying Russian crude at 30% discount. Well, Mr. Jayshankar said that what India buys is bought by the Europeans from Russia in one afternoon, and we might buy in one quarter. So, you see, you, you just get the perspective as to what's going on. So, um, obviously, you must listen to everyone, but make your own mind up. So, you know, there are a lot of entrepreneurs, like we said, that especially now with this uh, conversation, you know, who, um, among all my listeners, they would be very interested to know that you've also highlighted this very strategic opportunity, you know, for entrepreneurs and businesses in the wake of India's growth. And uh, can you elaborate a little bit on this? You know, what do you mean by this and what is it that entrepreneurs can look forward to? Well, I would be very careful when investing in India. Uh, because I know lots and lots of people who bought land and various other things and not done well out of it. But if you invest in the stock exchanges and let the companies that are part of the stock exchange do their work in India, after all, they have the contacts not only in government at federal and st state level, but they have people, they have, they're the ones who, who, who can use the money better or the share price better. So, uh, as you know, the, the, the stock market, the share price in India uh, of the Sensex, for example, which is the 30 top shares, has gone up from about 20,000 to 60,000, 60, I think, you know, which is uh, three times in about five or seven years. So 300%, where'd you make 300% anywhere else? I put some money into India, uh, into the stock market in October 2022, because I so, sort of said, you know, hang on, I better do something, or at least test it out. Well, at the end of April, which is one and a, 24, which is one and a half years, my money was up 34%. Now, where'd you get that? So, and you can convert it, it does go into rupees when you send dollars or pounds, but you can convert it in two days. And you can also say, okay, well, the dollar might lose, uh, sorry, the rupee might lose 5% of the dollar a year. Take that out of, of the 34%, you know, so 7.5% out, thank you very much, 26%. What's wrong with that? And by the way, the rupee didn't go down. Seven and a half percent, but it might. You know, so you you know you got to you got to take that into account. So do invest and be in control of your money uh, into the do invest in the stock market and be in control. You can always take it out, and it's an external account. That's where the whole catch is, you know, as to what what is that right time to take it out? Is I guess a lot of people really struggle with. I, I think you should be long term investors. Uh, the World Bank says that India by 2030, which is in six years' time, will have a uh, GDP of $7 trillion. This is the World Bank, not India. Okay? Uh, India says about $10 trillion, but let's go with $7 trillion. We're at about $3.5 trillion now, so you're talking about a 100% increase in six years. Wow. So if you look at the stock market, and invest in the Sensex 30 or the Nifty 50, which are the top 80 companies, best run because they have to uh, show to the public and they have to be audited and everything else. You should double that, right, to 200%. And then if you turn around and say, I want to go into, let's say, pharmaceuticals and infrastructure, which are the two big things happening in India. Infrastructure, I mean, the road building is amazing. Um, so people like Larson and Tubro and others, you can double that again to 400%. So then you discount it by 100%, let's say, 300% in six years, 50% a year or, I mean, forget it, 20% a year. <laughs> Better than here. 
your book actually, you know, what you believe that this is the era of the Indian uh, century, India's century, as you say, right? And you're also comparing this and drawing parallels with the past super global powers. So it's it's really intriguing. So can you just elaborate a little bit on this? Well, in the first 50 years of the century, I would suggest that it's China century. But in the whole century and the next 50 years, it'll certainly be India century. And of course, I'm not going to be around, but, but, but this is what I feel. And I think it's our population, it's the use of technology and smart, smartphones. It is every uh, thing that, that uh, the government is doing. And that could be the next government, uh, which could be a, a Congress government. You know, I don't mind. As long as they have learned and they're doing something rather than... Um, uh, allowing farmers um, to take loans and then, you know, mouth covering them, you know, just say, okay, okay, it's okay. This is election time. You don't have to pay the loans. And so those kind of things have a big effect on the economy. But now, now, of course, I see a lot of Indian businessmen taking money out of India. Yes. Uh, but the avalanche of money coming into India dwarfs that. And before long, when they bought their properties, and I mean, it's not much to, 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 to spend on a property, but once they've done all that and they've found, hang on, I can make more money in my home country, they'll all be bringing their money back too. <laughs> but the, but the, the, the avalanche of money coming in is enormous, and it should double. I'm keeping my fingers crossed on that. I'm not going to cross my eyes right now because we are on screen. Yes. Uh, so I'm going to request you to read a few lines from your book, you know, for uh, listeners that holds uh, very close to your heart. I, I, well, I, I wouldn't, as I said, but I have um, written something down. I wasn't ready for this, but hang on. Uh, you know, we talked, you introduced me and I said, I want, an India-UK trade deal. Uh, and this is such low-hanging fruit for both countries. Uh, I mean, let me give you one example. Uh, when you do a trade, by the way, there have been 14 negotiations and nothing's really happened. I'm, I'm sure they've moved, but 14 is a lot. Uh, and I, but I won't go into those. I'll just tell you why a trade deal is so important. Last year, India exported 21 billion pounds worth to the UK. The UK exported 15 billion pounds to India. So balance of payment, payments is on our side anyway. But we're saying 21 billion, 15 billion. Now, the point about a trade deal is that the duties come down to zero. Right? And when that happens, Trade doubles within three years. Okay, so the 15 billion from the UK would become 30 billion, and the 21 billion would become 42. And this is the case. I, I studied this when I was in the European Parliament. Of all the trade deals that they'd done, on average, it's double. Okay, so this extra 21, uh, 15 billion that the UK is creates 300,000 new jobs. Because for every 50,000 pounds you export, you create one job. 15 billion is 300,000 new jobs. Wow. From India, 21 billion coming here extra is 1 million new jobs in India. And God knows India needs new jobs because of the young population. So can you imagine a trade deal could do 1 billion new jobs for India? Yeah. And why is it not happening? Ego. Civil servants on both sides. Uh, and, and they don't have any skin in the game. They, 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 they might say they're advised by business, but they should have a 50-50 business civil service delegation talking about it. No, the civil servants are bigger uh, but the minister decides. 
Is it good for the vast population or not? A million jobs gives you a million votes. The minister will say, hang on, what are you talking about? Let's give in here or let's give in there on both sides. Or 300,000 jobs here, you know. So that is a travesty that we're not, we haven't done it. But the other, thing about the, the other thing about the trade deal is that you can't find service personnel in the UK. This is where the Indian professionals come in. In, in, in audit, in insurance, in, in, in education, various other things. In, you know, and I just want to point out that EFTA have just done a trade deal with India. EFTA is Norway, Switzerland, Liechtenstein, and Iceland. All of 15 million people, just 15, one five. They've done a trade deal with India. And the, it's a simple deal. And the deal is, is saying, 15 years, right? We could cancel after 15 years. 120 out of 156 service sectors, Indians can come in and work, right? Because we need workers. Obviously, they have to be proficient. They have to know English. They have to do all those sort of things. After Finished goods can be sold to 1.45 billion people. Swiss watches, chocolates, uh, you know, various other things can be sold into this huge market, duty-free, right? And there's a sweetener. And the sweetener is they will invest $100 billion, sorry, euros, into Indian manufacturing. So that's wow. in this one incredible. you get a hundred billion euros. Now you, you transpose that on the UK deal. Anyway. It'll be fantastic. No, no, not at all. I mean, I think, so, you know, I think um, for many of our listeners, they would li really like to know what would be the key takeaway, you know, from the book, uh, The Indian Century, and what can readers really expect? I, this book is all about Westerners and Indians. What, uh, what I want them to invest in India. Because it's such an easy thing to do. I mean, you're not that, oh, it's India, so let me put some money in because I like Indians. No, you're going to make money. Do it self for your own self. You know, that's the whole point about the book. Also, there is so many complexities, right, about trade, employment in this entire changing world, you know. So can you share a few practical, you know, guidance for some of our listeners who are probably looking to navigate this entire uh, landscape? And you know that uh, there is so many rules and regulations that go on, you know, that you, one has to go through. And it's quite daunting. Uh, what would you like to tell for that? So, as I said, Invest in the stock markets unless you live in India. I mean, there are lots of foreigners who live in India. And, and, and once you live in India and you know, know the lie of the land, then invest in your own businesses. But please don't, because there are lots of, as you rightly said, complexities of employment and, and other things, uh, unions, etc. Uh, I'm not saying unions are bad. I'm just saying that get to know what's going on before you invest. So you might think that you can make 40% a year, but then you have to uh, not give away, but there are things that you would never have thought logical being done in India where you have to give away 25%, you know, uh, because of the red tape or the paperwork or the whatever, you know. So I think uh, don't do that, just do this. Um, you're investing money in... in, in, in uh, uh, the Nasdaq, the London Stock Exchange, um, Euronext, etc. Well, invest some in India. Start with that. Sure. When you make money, do more. Or if you don't want to make, if you don't make money, do less. It's as simple as that. 
we will get our listeners to also hear that uh, as the nation the major says that invest in india that seems like a really sweet fruit hanging very low for us and i also know that you're writing your third book could you just share a little bit about that the benefits of immigration as a first generation immigrant uh i i've created 5000 jobs in the uk uh i have uh, uh ebook has had 2000 people working for it at at one time and uh i think that the indigenous population of, not only in the uk but all around the world needs to know why immigration is so beneficial so you don't want anyone and everyone you do want a points based system which of course the uk has where you get points for a degree you get points for educate uh, for 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 work experience and so on and so forth and if you reach a certain threshold you are most welcome to come and live here and the same goes for the us and the same goes for canada so we need immigration is good and not bad and what are your future plans if you can just tell us a little bit more because obviously there's so much of philanthropy work that you do and you know you're also writing now your third book what are the other plans that you have i you know play by ear i it's you know as you're growing older you're also saying hang on do i want to work i love i love working i don't like weekends <laughs> i love i love <laughs> working <laughs> uh, and you know of course Uh, I could go and play golf, but I, I try and work, uh, and uh, it's nice uh, if you uh, like working. But you know, it's been—I'm just too old now. So as I grow older, um, I'll change, like everyone does. So Dinesh, tell me: Are you? Do you enjoy dal chawal, or you like your Western food? How much of change has happened in you over the years? Do you still enjoy oh, Indian food? The, the thing about Indian food is that it's very tasty, but it's very fattening. So what one has to do is to ration it. And uh, so we have. Uh, my wife has now become totally vegetarian. So she has her own desi ghee vegetarian kitchen. <laughs> and I, I, I try and uh, eat in London and, and have meetings at the same time, or I. uh when i have something i try and have just one or two meals a day you know just to uh, get my weight down because as you grow older uh calories stick to you much more <laughs> than before <laughs> so i think i think i think there is some some of the best indian restaurants in london tell me which uh, is your favorite dinesh well there are three that are really really good uh one's jimkhana it's uh, it's got recently got two michelin stars uh, the other one is uh, trishna uh, in blandford street and the third one is brigadiers they're all owned by a friend of mine uh, who was in school with me in st xavier's delhi so uh, harsh city anyway uh, he has 23 restaurants in london but these three um, are indian the, the other like chinese and english and all that um french so uh, you can't go wrong and if you ever want to go to any of these restaurants i'll tell you what to order that goes on to the next episode <laughs> <laughs> thank you dinesh for being on today's podcast it's an absolute honor to have somebody as amazing and as successful as you and this is our first bridge india podcast and we are extremely honored to have you on our show Thank you well, thank again. Well, thank you so much, Marwa. It, it, it's it's been a pleasure talking to you, and uh, I haven't seen you as yet, as we're both members of Bridge India. But uh, hopefully, one of these days, uh, we'll we'll have we'll meet or have lunch together. Absolutely, look forward to that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. To you, our dearest listeners, you can find us on your favorite streaming services: Spotify, Amazon Music. Apple podcast and of course on all other major streaming services with loads of love we are the mohua show where we talk imandari se